Hello. So we are now live. Uh, we have 21 people. Morning, everyone. Do we, uh, we get, get started? Yeah. Good morning. Yep, yep, yep. It's all your show, Don. Go for it. All right. Let me. Uh, oh, actually, before we start, so for people on the call, um, Donald and our other Stephen, another Donald, will be presenting a bunch of exciting work for FRR. Um, for people who want to have who have questions or want to talk about things, please use two options: either send a chat in the chat window on the right hand side, or raise your hand using the raise hand option, and we'll cycle you in. We can only have one person asking questions at a time, so just bear with us on that. Okay, thank you, Donald. All yours. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming out to the FR workshop. Uh, as Sergi just said, we have uh, four presenters today. Myself, uh, Stephen Worley, who works at NVIDIA um, on the routing team. Donald Lee, who is a GSOC student and was selected to do the uh, FR routing, work on FR routing, and uh, we're really appreciative of that. And finally, we also have Anurata Karapai, who is uh, a principal engineer at NVIDIA as well. All right, let's get going. So here's the agenda for today. We're going to talk about uh, Five topics, the FR with DPDK data plane plugin integration, Lua, EVPN updates, backup next tops, and the upcoming FRR 8.0 release. And, and if we have time at the end, let's have a chance for people to ask questions or so we can interact with the audience and see what's going on there. All right, why don't you take us off? Okay, okay so today I'm gonna talk about something uh, super exciting. It's the data plane plugin, a new data plane plugin that we've been working on uh, using GPDK. Don, can you move the slide forward? Okay, so uh, for people who have been working with FRR already, you know that we have this concept of modular data plane plugins, right? And the kernel uh, interface is actually a data plane plugin too. It, it is something that is enabled by default, so most people don't realize that it's actually a, a, a data plane plugin. This is a, a lot of work that was done in the past couple of years to reorganize these data planes into these modules, right? And there is the second module called dplane FPM, which uh, we know that some other vendors use, but that's not what we're going to be talking about today, right? We're going to be talking about this third one here, the deep data plane GPDK plugin. And it came about is because of the sudden demand for GPUs, right? For network offload on GPUs specifically. I, I know GPU is a close topic to Shijit. <laughs> he was one of those uh, inventors of the GPU inventors. Uh, but recently, there has been a very high demand uh, for for that kind of network offload to do targeted routing function offload, right? Like you want to do uh, L7 based flow steering and so on. And we'll talk briefly about those use cases. So normally when you just put FRR on a host, people just see traffic going very slowly. They don't understand why traffic is not going at land rate. The reason why it's not going at land rate is because it has not been offloaded, right? So by doing a batteries included plugin, we're going to enable that by default. And this is the DPDK data plane plugin is the first of such batteries included uh, data planes. In the future, we're also considering other data planes, such as a P4 data plane, a TC data plane, or EBPF uh, based data planes, based on how, uh, what platform required this sort of network offload, and based on this first uh, DPDK based data plane plays out. Uh, Donald, can you please move, the, move to the next slide? All right, so we briefly talked about this. We talked about how FRR already has this modular data plane infrastructure, which lets you enable one or more than one plugin. The kernel plugin, obviously, is the one that's enabled by default. What we're going to try and do is instead of building a complete uh, forwarding pipeline, we're going to do targeted routing function offload. This is, in some ways, very similar to OBS, right? So a lot of people, OBS is pretty popular in, in server, in the server uh, world where it is deployed for network offload specifically, right? And what OBS does is also very targeted. It doesn't try to do uh, entire EVP pipeline, for instance. So we're gonna again go for those targeted routing function offloads. And the routing function that we specifically picked was the policy-based routing function, right? Which does a L3, L4 based flow steering. And uh, the use case that we kind of targeted was uh, two gateway solutions. 
servers configured it's configured with a single gateway and the server can be part of an evpn domain and it always talks to this anycast gateway using this distributed symmetric irb uh, solution evpn solution but with pbr you can have intelligent gateway so for example you could have a centralized gateway which is going to do some more sophisticated things it could send it to a firewall or load balancer and so on so using this l3 l4 match we can steer traffic to different gateways essentially right and we want to be able to do this at line rate so to speak so we're going to do a network offload using dpdk and uh, the reason for picking dpdk we could have picked anything there are several options that are available today for dp offload this dpdk this tc this p4 and so on we picked dpdk because right now that is uh, highly deployed right it's widely used so we wanted to just start with a plugin is easily accessible to everybody and we have tested this specifically on the nvidia bluefield 2 platform uh, bluefield 2 is a gpu uh, solution that nvidia has and we tested this plugin using that particular platform but any dpdk any standard l3 l4 match capable dpdk can be uh, dpdk platform can be used uh, with this plugin what we are planning to do in the future we want to do l7 right that's that's like the super interesting thing that gpu offers to do that dpi based in packet inspection so you want to do this dpi based packet steering uh, using pbr so that's the next step that's uh, imminent and uh, once that's done or even before that's done we'll probably upstream this data plane plugin so other contributors are welcome to add to it and if there is any interest in uh, deep uh, planes other than dpdk definitely us, we can get you started on that infrastructure as well. That was it. This is super exciting, right? And I really look forward to other contributors to this uh, module. So one of the, um, you know, when we designed the data plane plugins a few years back, you know, actually, let me rephrase this. You're, you're one of the first users or implementers of the data plane plugin. What would you do differently now that you've actually implemented something here? How could we improve our data plane? Right. So actually the data plane infrastructure is awesome, right? Let me first tell you that. It was li literally plug and play for me. And I actually developed this plugin as a part of a hackathon project for NVIDIA. So I was able to do it very quickly, right? And the reason for that is that uh, very elegant in infrastructure. So whatever goes to the kernel, those are mirrored to all the data planes. So it is super easy to plug into it and to program the uh, hardware using it. One a real challenge that I had was some of these uh, data planes, right? Like specifically, these uh, GPU data planes require an exploded uh, forwarding entry, right? So you can't just go and program it the same way you program the kernel. Like, for example, for PBR, you program a rule, then you program a separate routing table, then you program the name, you program the Mac, and so on. But when you go to the GPU, you have to explode it into a single entry, right? So that requires level of resolutions. So I think a uh, time has come to add a new HAL layer into Zebra to do that sort of resolution because multiple data planes are going to need that. OK, I know that there's, there's a question on the uh, from the audience. Here's Christian Hops. OK, go uh, ahead. Yeah, so I'm I'm sort of curious also about um, the uh, existing the NetLink support. Do you know? Um, what what level of like you know you L seven or L three you know what types of uh, PBR match does does that support? Do you know? Yeah, Christian, that's a good question, right? So right now the PBR that is there in the kernel is the uh, rule based PBR, so that's capable of L three L four, and subsequently it goes through the regular routing path. So you can do the sets that are possible with routing, which is essentially the D Mac S Mac set and so on. With uh, new enhanced GPUs, obviously you can go L7. Right now, that does, support doesn't exist in the kernel data plane plugin. So the way we have tried to do that is we have capabilities per data plane, and we decide if the flow can be programmed into that data plane or not. Did but if there is an interest in L7-based uh, flow steering, it should be possible to add that to the kernel networking stack as well. Yeah, I, I know we have some interest in, um, I mean, not so much calling it L7, but six tuple uh, matching. Um, okay. What's that? Yeah, I said go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and so, did you? Uh, do you, I mean? Do you? Do you have to make some changes? Is the current data plane plugin compatible with like a six tuple match, or is that also work that needs to be done in FRR? 
So, Krishna, what is the sixth tuple that you're looking at? Source dust, uh, source port, dust port, DSCP, uh, and a couple of others. I don't remember. Okay, so right now what we have is we can do SIP, DIP, IP protocol. Uh, we can do L4 source port, L4 dust port, and DSCP. Those are things that are possible in the kernel today. What we're trying to do with the L7 match is really go into, for example, if you want to do uh, one of the use cases that we have is to do name server domain based load sharing, right? Yeah. So that is really the L7 uh, sort of match that we are looking at. Uh, so that is not there in the kernel today, but when we do add this for the second data plane plugin, the GPTK plugin, there is a really good chance that we will extend it into the kernel. So, so it currently supports DSCP pr protocol the ports and the and the addresses that's six. yeah that's that's correct that's something that donald just added again it's part right. of the hackathon project that we just did and to to be pedantic it's not been accepted upstream it's pull request nine thousand and seven. yeah there you go in. that's the number you need to look I'm, I'm sure i'm sure we'll get in. okay one last final question is um is it is, does this also include support for um uh, directing traffic towards different queues, and that uh, that question is sort of ah. for both DPDK and Linux. I'm, I'm uh -huh. curious. Yeah, that is an excellent question. So right now, the way we're do doing flow steering is towards the port. We're doing it at the lower lowermost level, right? But directing it towards queues is definitely something that li list of things to do in the future. I should probably put that. That is like super interesting from a DPU perspective. So we will definitely add that. But but there is a there is a problem with that approach though, right? Because there is a bigger problem in sort of the whole question. FRR is a routing platform. People right. don't do queue steering out of the routing platform, right? It's done at a lower level or it's done at it's either RSS control or whatever else that is underneath. Uh, you want to be careful about not putting too much into FRR that is more than routing, because then your cross-platform routing capability becomes heavily polarized towards a single monolithic solution. So I, so I think we, this is going to be a tricky question. We, I mean, we definitely want to be able to do PBR rules that direct towards different uh, queues. Um, just an application standpoint, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess maybe you're saying it should come from somewhere else. It, there needs to be a second layer, right? Because routing is not the only thing that goes to queues. You could have RSS that's, a, that's sort of uh, affecting queues as well, which is independent of the routing. Yeah, no, so, I mean, I guess I'm thinking about it like a Cisco router, right? Like if I'm trying to build, if I'm trying to build the same functionality that I get with a Cisco router, it's kind of all. But Cisco routers give you cost queues; they don't give you NIC or or device queues. Then that queue is different, and I, I think that's the point I'm trying to make. That if you t think of it as a routing platform where you have cost queues, absolutely, I think that's that's totally in in scope. But if you're talking about device queues and DMA regions and oh, IMU yeah. regions, then you don't want that in the routing platform because that's no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah, I meant cost queues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely right. So, Christian, uh, Shijit, it's actually a super interesting debate, right? It's a debate that we've constantly had, even in the DPDK side. And this is something that even OBS has kind of uh, struggled to draw the line at because OBS similarly has a DPDK plugin. And what you bring up is uh, is fair, right? But uh, some amount of the RSS management has been moved into the DPDK APIs. And so people have that easy one, easy answer where they just use this one component to do everything. So I, I hear what you're saying. That's an interesting debate. Problem. No, it needs to be. I, I'm not saying that. So I agree with uh, another, and I agree with what you just said. If you think appliance, I think DPDK as a layer makes sense, but you don't want it to bleed through into FRR. That's what I'm saying, right? Because right. FRR is a port router, like it's a router, right? It, it decides. Anyway, uh, the, 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 well, there is one more question, uh, which may be already addressed, which is, uh, hopefully you can see the question. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, that, that's an excellent question, right? What does batteries included mean, right? So uh, again, I'll, I'll kind of encourage you to think about it uh, in a way similar to OBS, right? OBS is probably the existing answer uh, to the question that you have. This has a inbuilt. OBS, if you think about it, what does OBS really give? It gives you a learning bridge. It gives you a, a controller-based, open flow-based, match set flow steering. 
happen, right? Uh, so that's really what OBS does. But OBS is batteries included. What exactly does that mean? You put OBS on a server, you're going to get line rate traffic forwarding, right? And the reason is OBS has two data plane plugins, which is really the GPDK plugin and the TC plugin for closed tiering, right? So that's really how they're able to achieve that, uh, those kind of uh, functionality at line rate. Now, FRR, when it had added the kernel data plane plugin, it really relied on a kernel driver doing that offload, right? Or it, the second data plane plugin that we had was the deep plane FPM plugin, which is like VMware use, for instance, right? Where the FPM module is doing that. So it's not included. It relies on a second driver being present. Either level uh, driver or a user space driver like the FPM to do that task for you. But what we want to do is what OBS does, which is basically by having by call, calling out the GPDK APIs and wherever the drive, there's obviously going to be a GPDK driver that runs on the platform, right? Which is external to FRR. FRR is not responsible for the driver. It's just going to be an Intel driver or it could be a Mellanox driver, which is going to in take these DPDK callouts and do that offload for you. So essentially, that's what we mean by batteries included. This is the first time we're doing the batteries included answer, uh, which is similar to the obvious included answer. All right. Thank you, Anuradha. I, I, I hate to cut you this short, but in the interest of time, I think we do need yes. to move on. <laughs> But uh, there's one more, uh, unfortunately, Donald, there's one more question. There's a question. Do it. Uh, let's try to address it quickly, and then we or we'll move it to the end if needed. So let's, Igor, you're up. Yeah, hi. C can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. So uh, two quick questions. First question, is this work already open sourced or is it going to be open sourced? It's going to be open source very soon. This plugin has been completed and tested, like I said, and we're going to uh, put it out as a uh, PR in the next few weeks. OK, very cool. Thanks. And the, the second question, if we are talking about the future and the moving of uh, LPM uh, into this plugin, uh, for example, if we talk about Bluefield 2, is it capable of like having millions of rules of routes? For example, if we have the full BGP view table uh, in, in in FRR, will yes, it be capable yes, it of uploading? Capable. Yeah. Yes, it is capable of doing that. In fact, with OBS, it supports 2 million rules. Cool. Thanks. OK, let's move on. Um, yeah, thank you, Anarad, again. Um, all right, next up is Donald Lee with the Lua Hook system. He's our GSOC 2021 student. Uh, take it away. Hello. Hey, Donald. We can hey, hear you. Everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about the uh, Lua Hook system for FRR. Um, I'm, implement I'm implementing it under 2021 GSOC. And uh, yeah, I'm a final year computer science student at the National University of Singapore. And why FRR? Um, because I wanted the chance to work on something low level, like related to programming languages and kind of close to systems programming. Yeah, next slide, please. Right. So have you ever wanted to um, implement some sort of a custom matching logic for route maps or sort of uh, contact some third party service, like when a route install fails, maybe you can tweet it. So uh, hook calls can help you out here. Yeah. Next slide, please. So uh, hook calls are not new. Um, if you've played with the source engine before, um, hook calls are used to add a lot of uh, scripting cap capability to, to script things like uh, characters and events. And you can use hook calls to kind of create entire games, entire game scenes. And uh, and yeah, and the source engine is, uh, this is one way that the source engine is, is, is really extensible. So what this buys us is a lot of uh, extensibility. Right. Next slide, please. Yeah. So why a hook system for FRR? So it allows us to implement logic without changes to the source code uh, for things like logging and uh, accessing, accessing external services. And ideally, we want to do this in a type safe and transparent and configurable way. And why Lua? Lua is a lightweight scripting language and is used uh, widely in many projects uh, for precisely this kind of scripting behavior, uh, a lot in games and also in uh, Apache projects. Next slide, please. So where can we place hook calls in FRR? Uh, we might want hook calls when a route is installed. Uh, we want to want to signal when it's uh, when it's a success or when it's a failure. Um, we, we've also 
uh, implemented one for BGP route map match, uh, and additional hook calls um, you decide. Uh, next slide, please. So here I have an, I have a, an example of uh, how uh, FR users can uh, what FR users can do with uh, Lua scripts with the PGP roadmap match. Uh, yep, uh, can we play the screen share? Oh right, there's no. Uh, I guess. Uh, okay, I'll just talk over this. So here I have two peers in a PGP session. Uh, R1 is peering against R2, and I am sending a I'm setting a route map on R1. Right. So this is a Lua script um, that can, uh, can con conditionally. Uh, this is where we can implement uh, our custom logic for matching on routes, and we can take a prefix, uh, attributes, peers, and we can return if we want to match or if we don't want to match. And we can even set uh, attributes uh, on, the, uh, on the routes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I added 1.1.1.1 slash 32 into the route map. Uh, all right, sorry, that's the next screen. So I can just modify the Lua script, and the and the changes will will go in directly. So I'm re-advertising the route. Yep, and we can see that it's matched, and the attributes have been changed. So next, I'm showing a Lua script which uh, instead of logging, uh, it tweets out the, uh, the, the, the match status. Right? So this, uh, this is using the uh, Lua tweets, uh, Lua rocks package. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna use the route match command to implement this route map. So match script, script and this takes a Lua file name. So the API doesn't uh, constrain you to a certain file name. Uh, all it does is you just give it a file name and it looks for a, a hook function with a particular name. And, and it's gonna run that function when, the, when it hits the hook call. Yep. So now I'm setting up the route map for PGP. And I'm going to re-advertise the route. And yeah, we can see on Twitter um, that our route, uh, the status of our route match. Yep. So that's what uh, FR users can do uh, with uh, this lower scripting capab capability. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. So how can FR devs implement uh, hook calls? Uh, in general, they just they just need to do these steps. You need to identify the file, identify the function, um, make the hook call. Uh, with uh, there's there's more to that, and get the results back. And of course, uh, kind of document very clearly uh, what are the arguments uh, for the hook call for the hook function and what the user writing the script should return for for an effect to take place. Uh, next slide, please. So. Uh, Making the hook call uh, requires writing encoders and decoders for uh, C data structures into Lua and vice versa. And this is where bulk of the work is going, is actually going into making it more convenient for users to uh, encode data structures uh, from C to Lua and decode them back. Uh, unfortunately, this requires knowing a little bit about the C Lua API, and in, in particular, that, the, uh, that Lua communicates with C using a stack so the, the gist of it is that for every type that we want to encode onto Lua, uh, you need to write an, an encoder, encoder function that takes the struct and kind of pushes it onto the stack as a Lua table, uh, and, and also the other way around to get uh, your struct back. But the good news is that uh, you only have to write it once. Once you register the encoders and decoders, 
uh, based on type. Uh, you don't have to write them anymore. And there's a bit of type inference uh, going on to kind of automatically match the type of an, an argument with its uh, encoder and decoder. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, in the future, uh, I intend to implement a btysh command to show hooks and their, and their arguments uh, and their return values, uh, and also lower packages, uh, like the one that you just saw using a, that can help us like tweet stuff, uh, and also logic to uh, conditionally control uh, which, which hooks we want to always run and which hooks that we don't want to always run. Yeah, and so the, the, the implementation is, is currently in progress. And yep, that's a lower hook calls. So which ones have, I'm sorry, which hooks or predefined um, encodings have already been defined? Uh, currently, there is only one hook call, which is the BGP route map match one. Let me ask the question again. I'm sorry, I asked yeah. it early. So you, we can encode struct prefix. Which What, what other, else besides prefix and attributes have been encoded, currently written, so people can take right. advantage of it now? Um, so there's, uh, for BGP, I had to create one for peer and, uh, and, and, uh, some other structures. Yeah. So the, the intention here is to implement, uh, common ones for FRR, but for people writing, uh, their own structs, they're going to have to make their own encoders and decoders. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I think, is there raised hands? I don't see any raised hands. There are, hang on. Okay. Uh, so here's Christian again. Hi, uh, am I on? You are. Oh, great. Yeah. So it, it, it looks like, um, so this first version is uh, basically the hook and then you return a result. Has there, a, I, and I suspect this is not included in it. Is there uh, the thoughts about um, allowing call calling back into FRR? So, for example, you know, I don't know, you want to add a route or something, right? That it isn't specifically defined as the result, but you know, you you want to have these side effects happen inside FRR based on the hook running. Right. Um, the side effects are exposed through return values in Lua. Um, uh, are you asking if uh, we can run? So, uh, I can answer it. Basically, oh. uh, no. That's outside. Of, that's not something we're looking for. This if a if a hook point, if a dev wants a hook point to have uh, effects after it's returned, they have to implement that in the handling of the return value. Right. I mean, but has it, it, it been thought about? Like maybe as like second second iteration. <laughs> you know, it's basically exposing some of the. You know, Zebra APIs is what I'm kind of thinking. Uh, it's probably been thought about, but it will not happen. Maybe next net dev. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, okay. And yeah. a second question uh, would be, um, is, uh, uh, is is this work being structured in a way to, with, you know, the idea that maybe someday uh, other languages could be put in there? Um, I'm thinking of like compiled languages, right? Uh, not ones that have to be compiled with FRR, but can be plugged in later. Uh, I, no. don't, I don't think there's been any thought about that. Lua was mainly chosen because of its embeddability and its scriptability. That's right. that's the reason why I chose it originally when I you know started this project sure. five years in the past. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's keep moving. We have Quentin. Young. Quite done yet. Oh, Quentin, you're on. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the mentors for this GSOC project, and I just wanted to answer a couple of those questions. So that regarding the calling back into C space from Lua, um, yes, that's actually been implemented already for the for logging. So from within a Lua script, you can call back into our internal logging uh, code in order to log messages through Zlog normally. So we at least have that implemented and and if there's a good use case for it, we can definitely do it. Um, but as a first iteration, yeah, we're focusing on not doing that. Um, someone asked in the chat if we considered using Luigit or if it was like 
which version of Lua it is. It's 5.3. Vanilla, we didn't use Lua yet because it's on 5.1, and uh, it's not really being maintained anymore. And um, I don't remember what the other question was, but I think it was answered properly already. So, Thanks, Quentin. Yeah. Thanks, Quentin. So and we have Jafar. Uh, Jafar, you're on now. Yeah, thank you. I was just question is kind of related to what Donald hinted to uh, initially is is the idea to provide a set of built-in encoders decoders or or you always have to write your encoders and decoders if you want to use Lua or or is right. a combination of both I guess there's I think it's it's a chicken and egg kind of problem I think yeah. as people use this the encoders will be written you know like FR currently has a whole bunch of printf FR you know printf specifiers that are built in, I, I imagine we'll end up doing the same type of thing here. It's just a matter of time at this point in time. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, Donald, uh, back to you. Yeah, so again, thanks, Donald. Uh, we really appreciate the work you're doing here. It's awesome. All right, uh, Swirly, uh, you're up with some EVPN updates for everyone. Hey, everybody. Yep. Uh, great work to Dom. He is excellent. Uh, so we're going to get into some stuff that got added to... Let me maximize my screen. Uh, so we're going to get into some stuff that got added into EVPN in the last year, basically, uh, since the last net dev, functionally. Uh, one of the big things that got added was EVPN multi-homing. And I'll, I'll try to go a little faster here so we have time at the end. Uh, Anurata in this call is actually the one who implemented this. So please correct me if I say anything wrong here. Uh, so background and motivation on why we'd want multi-homing to begin with. Uh, the idea here is to replace MLAG in the data center clause for active-active use cases. Uh, traditionally, MLAG requires a dedicated peer link uh, between switches, and it uses a proprietary control plane implementation. There is not in any shape or form standards-based, so inter vendor interop is basically non-existent. Uh, bond and link failures are uh, handled within the rack, so remote uh, PEs do have no idea about um, failures across the fabric. With EVP and MH, we don't require the dedicated peer link. Uh, standards based using just BGP and RFC route types for control plane. Uh, and you have uh, guaranteed uh, support for greater than two uh, routes in a redundancy group, whereas that is usually a vendor specific uh, thing with MLAG or alternative MLAG alternatives. Next slide. All right, uh, one of the main constructs that EVPNMH added to FRR is uh, this idea of Ethernet segments, where you have a group of links that are connected to the same uh, uh, server by a, more or less, it's, it's basically you're saying we're connected to the same server as what an Ethernet segment represents. And in this example here, you can see Leaf 11, Leaf 12 connected to a host 11. They both have uh, the same Ethernet segment of ID 1 here. It's highlighted red. Uh, and the way that works is that each e Ethernet segment is a distinct redundancy group. So with MLAG, you have two switches that redundancy group. With EVPNMH, you have an Ethernet segment. So it's a little bit, it's like a layer below. So that allows uh, a router to be a part of multiple redundancy groups. Uh, next slide, please. And here's an example of exactly what I'm talking about. So because because of this uh, redundancy group being not switch specific, right? It's Ethernet. It's a, a little bit lower. Then you can have a situ you can have multiple, uh, really as many as you want, but ideally just greater than two uh, redundancy groups here. So you can see Leaf twelve is in multiple Ethernet segments with uh, uh, L one or L Leaf eleven and Leaf thirteen for hosts eleven and twelve. All right. Next slide, please. Um, one of the, well, the primary way that this is actually propagated across the fabric is route uh, type one's Ethernet auto discovery types. Uh, you use these to tell uh, all the PEs in the in the fabric about Ethernet segments that exist, every single one. Uh, they'll carry the Ethernet segment ID, uh, which can be two types. This is a bit vendor specific. Uh, some vendors only carry the EAD per, per ES. We carry both, or we'll, we'll use both types. Uh, EAD per ES right here means one route is generated per Ethernet segment by the provider 
the PE is attached to the Ethernet segment. And then um, EAD per EVI means one route is generated per Ethernet segment per VNI by the PEs that are attached to the ES. And EAD per ES, per ES is actually one that's going to propagate link failure. So it's the most important one. Uh, EAD ES and EAD EVI routes are imported by all PEs in the pod. So make note of that. Every single ES, whether it's even part of, even if they even if they don't share an Ethernet segment, then they'll still import the the route into their database so they can maintain state about those Ethernet segments from across the fabric and they can independently respond to link failures, which will be very important coming here in a bit. Next slide. Uh, here's an example of just what Ethernet segment configs look like in FRR. Uh, basically, it's all statically configured. Next slide. Uh, one thing with that if EVPN MH makes use of uh, for the type two route is using them for sync routes. And what that means is that a type two route is used to carry the FDB and neighbor syncing between uh, Ethernet segment redundancy peers. So you have two local peers, or two local redundant peers that they need to both have maintain the same FDB and neighbor databases, right? So you use uh, sync routes to do that. And they also are used a type two route is also used to carry the remote route information. So for a remote, uh, it'll have the ESID and it'll recognize the, the router will recognize it's not local. The FDB entry will port to a uh, point to a network port. If it recognizes this uh, Ethernet segment ID that it's local, which it would already have gotten from these type two, it would already have this database from the type one uh, routes that were advertised prior, then it knows that this is a redundant um, PE that it's that it's um, that's also attached to the same exact server. So Ethernet segment attached to the same server. So basically, we just point to our local access point here. Uh, one interesting optimization about this is that we can use sync uh, neighbor and FTP entries to proxy advertise failures. So let's say our redundant peer fails before it's able to withdraw the route, right? So it's functionally it but we can we don't need to actually withdraw it here because we can uh, use the same Ethernet segment that we've installed as a sync. So even though it didn't originate the type one or the type two, rather, I mean, uh, it knows that it's connected to the exact same Ethernet segment. So theoretically, they are supposed to be there. So we trust this sync and we keep advertising it. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, this is what. Uh, the packet actually looks like. So before this would always be uh, zero with the highlighted portion, but now we carry it with the ID. Next slide. Uh, one really cool construct that EVPN MH is really the first uh, feature to make use of in FRR is L2 and L3 next stop groups. L2 specifically were created for EVPN H. And it makes a lot of sense because the whole idea of next stop groups is to separate and decouple this idea of a route from what it's pointing to for uh, more efficient failover use cases. And with EVPNH, because we basically, a type one route is carrying an ESID, which really is just a next hop at the end of the day. And then the type two route only carries um, the route and then an ESID that it points to. So it really makes a lot of sense to use next hop groups specifically for EVMH. Next slide. So how do we actually get knowledge of these next hop groups, right? So we build up a database of Ethernet segments in each PE, every single one, remote or local, from type one routes. And we infer we infer how to create the next hop groups from the VTEP IPs. We build uh, the L2 next hop groups from this database, VNI agnostic. Uh, a single e Ethernet segment ID represents a specific next hop group. So, uh, since type two routes are just the Ethernet segment ID as a destination, from that we can point to the appropriate L2 next hop group or FTP entry. So it is inferred exactly like this. We get a type two route with ESI. We from the ESI we we can recognize what next hop group it should point to. The next hop group we've created from uh, type one advertisements as well prior for him. All right, next slide. And uh, this is what it looks like in the kernel. Uh, as you can see, the FDB entry is pointing to next hop group ID. And then that's 
goes into a three-way ECMP. All right, next slide. Uh, and then L3 next subgroups. Uh, in this example, I'll be using its uh, assumed symmetric routing. We have two levels of ECMP at, at L3 functionally. So the underlay ECMP, which uh, isn't new, we're all familiar with that one, which just happens in the default verf. And then the overlay ECMP, which is really what um, we're getting at here with L3 next subgroups. Uh, every single tenant verf will create uh, an Ethernet segment. Every single Ethernet segment and tenant verf combination uh, will create an, a unique L3 next stop group from, from that it can handle for fast failover. And this is what it looks like actually in the kernel. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so now we get into why we need these, why they're cool, why we should add thing add these to other protocols. Uh, Primarily, they're redundant. They're, we need redundancy and speed with a fast failure, right? Uh, the triggers come from access port failure, uh, Tor VTEP reboot, either uh, switch upgrades or whatnot, uh, and uplink failures. And there's actually two ways to do fast failover. The only one I'm going to talk about here is L2, L3 next type group use. But there, there's also this idea of using your ESB bond to redirect. Uh, local traffic failover via the VXLAN overlay, but that is not currently just supported in the kernel. Uh, we at NVIDIA use um, the Mellanox drivers to handle this, but ideally what you would do here is the the kernel would take care of uh, using a backup L2 next type group to redirect local traffic without ever having to uh, do any actually data plane updates or um, control plane updates from FRR. So maybe in the future we'll have that. Next slide, please. All right, but for the L2, L3 next type group use case is remote uh, bridge traffic failover. Uh, so a quick reminder, the L2 next type groups are maintained per ES. So every single Ethernet segment across the fab fabric will create a L2 next type group. Uh, and on port slash ES link failure detection by provider edge, it sends a single Ethernet or EAD ES route withdrawal. From this route withdrawal, we can uh, update the underlying L2 NSG construct from that. And every single P remote local will fail over to the correct uh, group. And note here that this is a single update into the fabric, one up, and then one update into each uh, provider edge's data plane, always. No matter the number of hosts connected that failed the link, no individual max get have to be updated here. It is a single, is a, is a single um, command into the data plane functionally. All right. Next slide, please. Uh, the same will be uh, true for routed traffic. Uh, very similar concept. L3 NHG maintain per ES, per tenant verf, like I said before. Uh, on poor ES link failure detection by the PE, it'll send a, a withdrawal with that withdrawal of process in the exact same way. But now we're withdrawing the VTAP IP from the L3 next up group. All of, all of it happens in the, independently on every remote PE. And then, so that's one, once again, that's one update into the fabric and one update into the data plane, no matter how many number of hosts connected, no matter how many individual routes. So no, we're not, we're not update. If we have, if we have a thousand routes that have to be updated, only one actual data plane update is sent. All right, next slide, please. So some of the enhancements we had to add to L3 next slide groups and NFR to, to add this, uh, we'll go into those. Uh, EVPNMH is really the first one to make use of that, but they could be extended theoretically to any protocol uh, that has a use case for them, and they're extremely powerful uh, for this exact like use case of failing over like thousands of routes with a single data plane update. So to do that, we added uh, a couple new Zappy handling libraries. We added next start group add, next start group delete to handle to handle add delete replace, very similar to how route replace happens. Um, and next hop group, I, well, we also added the idea of an, passing in a next hop group ID to uh, route add with Zappy rather than uh, a full blown on next hop group. So in this kind of scenario, each daemon kind of owns an ID space. So EVPNH owns an ID space of next hop groups it can allocate. And it'll tell Zebra, hey, I want to add this next hop group. I want to replace this next hop group. I want to change or modify, delete it. And Zebra just does, does so, kind of, it doesn't really care 
um, about much more than I trust this and I use it. And then uh, on creation, a callback is sent to the daemon. Daemon can send the uh, the route down with pointing to the next type group ID only rather than a full group, as I said before. Zebra installs into this kernel with the ID. And then let's like the exact same use case with the remote failover with EDPNH. Uh, any routing protocol could say, hey, I have a thousand routes pointing to this single next type group and I need to send a route update to uh, point them to a new next type group. Either I lost a, a remote IP or I want to add one. And that is many routes. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to show a demo, but first let me just say it's basically a 16-way ECMP. Uh, and one other thing to note here is if you do want to try this out and you want you want to verify that it's only one data plane update, you do need to turn off compat mode. Compat mode just is a way, is something you would turn off on really anytime you're running FRR as the main user of routes or, and next ops. Without, with compat, compat mode is turned on by default. And basically when you get a, uh, I see a next subgroup add or delete. It'll blow it up, and it'll it'll actually send over uh, Netlink anyone who's registered to to listen on it that about those about those failures or about those uh, route changes without so that they can handle it because not every uh, user space uh, thing can handle it right now. Right? All right, just click that if you don't mind. Did that, did that work, Donald? I'm sorry, what did you want me to do? Uh, can you click the ASCII? Uh, the, yeah. Give me a second. I need to share it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't embed this. Sorry. Didn't realize you're doing it. I'll do it. I'll share my um, entire uh, share screen, Chrome tab. Sure. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. I was I was not prepared. I just hit play. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just demonstrating with uh, Sharp D this exact use case I was talking about. Basically, we we had a route. I turned compat mode off. Um, this is what the route looks like. 16 way ECMP. Uh, I'm going to turn on IP monitor to monitor next stop updates and route updates. Uh, we're going to go in and we're going to remove one of the one of the next outs from the ECMP group. All right, so it's the same group. And you can see 61 was removed, 161 was removed, which would be 1.111 or 1.1.1 here. And then we can look at IP monitor that we had going and we'll see uh, a single update was sent. The delete happens after because we don't have any more things using that. All right, you can go back to the slides now. Okay, but the moral of the story that of why I wanted to show that was basically I wanted to demonstrate how this can be added to any protocol where the use case makes sense, right? So anytime you have hundreds of thousands of routes that you want to update in a single um, failover scenario or update scenario, you can do so now, to, today. So add them to your routing protocols. <laughs> uh, I think there might be one more slide. OK, yeah. Com so coming soon with EVPN uh, is single VXLAN device support, which basically is a scalability enhancement that allows you to use uh, one single VX underlying VXLAN device and and use it with multiple VNIs uh, via, via mapping. And then also downstream VNI, which enables you to assign a VNI from a downstream remote VTEP through VPN, uh, rather than having to configure individual VNIs globally across the network. Primary use case for that is access to shared devices. Uh, we're making use of the um, lightweight tunnel kernel construct to do this, where we encap that VNI in this example, 2004. 204003, that is not a locally known VNI. We encap, we encap it and then are able to tunnel through it without even not having any knowledge about that VNI. All right. I think that's that should be all of it. I think we might. Do we have we any have, questions? We have one question. 
Uh, I think it has already been implemented, or it's on, it's, no wait, NRI, yeah, you answer this. And it has, it, it is upstream, available upstream. All right, so great, thanks for the answer. One thing that is, you know, interesting to me is, you know, you talked about the ability to quickly switch over. Do we have timings or have timings been done on how fast the uh, a replacement next stop group happens in the OS kernel? Yes, it's, it's, I mean, assuming compat mode is turned off, it is incredibly fast. I don't have the timings on hand. I'm sure they would still be platform dependent, but it is like, it's obviously sub second for it's just a single, a single update. Okay. From a user plan's perspective. Yeah, yeah we then, have, yeah, sorry. We, we do have numbers from the Spectrum 2 and Spectrum 3 platforms. It's less than 20 milliseconds. Yeah. Okay. But it is a it is an up and down through software, right? As opposed to using a, a bond group or a lag group to do the do the same thing. Is that is that a fair comparison? Yeah, that's a fair comparison, Shriji. So bond the kernel driver itself would do it, but in this case FRR will have to go and update the next stop group. Yeah. Okay. I mean it's still obviously way more I mean, we, we we have some scars, shared scars on this. In this space, well, oh, so clearly this is a, <laughs> we have this is obviously a very very good uh, design step forward, and it also obviously helps that the kernel implemented the, the broken up uh, next stop group uh, from the route infrastructure. So so I'm very excited to see this happen. All right, any other questions, Sujit? Not not that I'm seeing. All right, I'm going to. All right, so we basically have uh, two sections left with nine minutes left in the presentation. I think the backup next tops and FRR integration is probably a bit more important, so I'll cover that first, hopefully fairly quickly. So uh, what is a backup next stop? Uh, effectively, it would be nice if we could pre-compute the, what the data plane should do when a interface or something bad happens. And there are a couple different uh, protocol specifications or RFCs that kind of uh, allow you to do that in Rowden. Um, currently, there's IP FRR, TILFA, BGP PIC, and MPLS FRR. And FRR, in this case, is fast reroute, not free range Rowden. Um, that was unintentional when we named it that way. But so the, the, the goal is to pre compute and um, allow the data plane to react instead of having the data plane tell you that something bad has happened and then react. All right, so, so how is this gonna be implemented? Effectively, what we've done is that each individual next hop can specify up to eight backup next hops. And in this example here, uh, we have one route for four, five, six, seven, which is installed for 192.168.11 and it has a backup route for 192.168.140. Uh, from a design perspective, you can have uh, IP routes and MPLS LSPs need to support backup next stops. Uh, you can have up to eight backup next stops per next stop and you have a limit of 256 backup next stops in total. And that's mainly just to limit communication and I don't think people are really gonna ever really need to see that kind of level of, of back and next talks. Uh, we had to extend the Zappy to allow the upper level protocols to say, hey, here are my backup next stops and here's how they match up. Uh, when Zebra receives these routes, it's going to resolve each backup next stop as you would normally resolve each next stop. Um, reachability or like next stop tracking or re redistribution uh, will also now include sending the backup next stop information up to interested parties. Um, and, and finally, backup next stops are presented to the data plane for processing. And, and I kind of said it this way specifically because as it currently stands, there isn't a kernel Linux kernel implementation that has been accepted that allows you to, um, to actually program the Linux kernel with these backup next stops. Uh, this code has already been implemented uh, in pull request 6765. It was the base implementation where it was just the infrastructure to allow it to happen. 
And then, and then OSPF TILFA was implemented in 7127. It's going to be in the 80 release. And so, so that I, I, I can see some of you going, how does this work now that we don't actually have a Linux kernel implementation? As I stated in the previous slide, the backup next hops are presented to the data plane plugins for, um, for consumption. And the people who submitted the TILFA work have their own private data plane. Um, plugin that they use that consumes that data and sends it to the their interested parties. All right, so what is next? We actually need the kernel implementation in place. And then it's just a simple matter of programming the Linux kernel via the Netlink API. Um, the kernel implementation is out for an RFC. Um, it'd be nice if someone can make it happen. All right, so that's the backup next ops. I didn't, I can't tell if there's questions, Sajit. Do we lose Sajit? No, no, I'm hiding. Uh, no, no questions at this point. I guess that was very clear. Got it. All right, um, I'm gonna skip through the FR80 release. I wanna hit the high points. The 80 release is coming out in the next couple of days. It's approximately two thirds of a year of active development. And, you, and the reason why I say that is because we typically release three times a year, but we did not, re we released a point release in back in February that didn't include any new development. It was just a bug fix release, mainly because of all the new active development. There were some some features that we wanted to get right before we released. Uh, it's so FR80 is gonna be 2200 commits. There's 91 different contributors. Uh, the One of the important things that people need to be aware of is that Libyang 2.0, we've upgraded to. Um, why are we upgraded to Libyang 2? Well, there's two reasons. Uh, the performance improvement between Libyang 1 and 2 is orders of magnitude better. The second reason is that the Libyang 2 developers uh, stops, basically stopped doing uh, fixes and or uh, improvements on Libyang 1 and decided to start over. So we were kind of forced to upgrade. Um, the other highlights are that we have, from a debuggability standpoint, is we have trace point support now built in. Um, effectively, if you have, if, if you want to trace how FR runs, you can now do that via external software. And finally, we have added a daemon called Pathy, which allows you to implement segment round and policy, policies. Uh, I'm gonna skip the trace point size, just gonna have it in here for people to look at later. There's a whole bunch of features and RFCs that have been implemented. Basically, BAP, um, OSPF and BGP were the main winners of what work was being done. And finally, I wanted to talk to continue to um, expound on our CI system and how it's imperative that as we receive new features that uh, we receive topology tests for those features and we need to continue to improve our uh, test coverage just so that we don't have regressions. All right, any questions? Okay, uh, I mean, uh, we can stay for a few minutes longer, so if people are feeling rushed about questions. Uh, yeah, definitely. Maybe. But uh, if, you, if no one asks, we'll be done. And I should say that there are, so this platform allows us to have lounges, so if people, specifically speakers, want to hang around, you can just go join a lounge. So when you go to the lounge on top, you'll see a bunch of tables, pick a table, and then other people can come hang out at the table with you. It looks like this, but everybody can speak. So uh, with a minute to spare, looks like this was an action-packed presentation. And, and thank you. I mean, this was actually a very wide coverage. I do remember the days when FRR was being born and uh, and it's clearly come a long way and, and we, you know, you remember Donald, when we were worried about the viability of 
the community and looks like a community and you guys have really stepped up and and it's become more than viable it's become a de facto standard which uh, i think is highly commendable and and really speaks to the amount of effort and and passion that has gone into it um so thank you and thank you audience and uh, we'll see you at our next talk yes thanks for having us oh i like I, I like that Little hearts. Some claps, cool emojis. I'll, I'll let it run for a while. Oh, there's some party hats too. And a gold cup. There should be music with this. Anyway, see you Thanks, everybody. everybody. See you later.